So Peter Eigen, thank you for visiting the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. You've been a leader in the global struggle against corruption, a founder of Transparency International. So now some 23 years after the founding of Transparency International, how do you assess the global struggle to combat and control corruption? How are we doing? I think we are doing very well. I know that there are a lot of people who fear that you hear more about corruption nowadays than uh, before we were founded. Uh, you hear about Panama Papers, you hear about grand corruption in Russia, in uh, China, in uh, Nigeria. And so people feel uh, maybe there is more corruption now than at that time. But uh, my view is quite different. I believe that uh, today um, the global society has learned how damaging, how dangerous corruption it is. They have learned how um, uh, destructive it is and how much uh, corruption leads to uh, to bloodshed and, and conflicts everywhere, to uh, streams of refugees, uh, or misery and, and, um, uh, and, and destitution. And therefore people are angry about corruption. They have no more tolerance with corruption. And um, things which uh, about 15 years ago, say 1999 for instance, uh, 17 years ago, would have been accepted as quite normal. They are now being uh, prosecuted, they appear in the news, uh, and um, many institutions are fighting corruption. So it has become a, a global awareness uh, against corruption. But uh, of course, uh, it has not yet really resolved the problem, but it is, uh, in my opinion, very much on the mind of the of the people in the world and of the institutions, and I feel very proud about it. Are there particular countries or particular reforms that you regard as landmark achievements in terms of progress in combating and controlling corruption? I think the greatest step forward was um, the OECD Convention Against Foreign Bribery because uh, this uh, sort of scandalous system where most rich countries, with the exception of the United States, uh, where there is a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but most of the other countries um, allowed their companies to bribe outside their borders. Not only did they allow it, they even subsidized it and promoted it through tax write-offs, through subsidies and so on. And this has changed. Uh, there is a real um, uh, see change in the sense that uh, most of the rich countries now prosecute corruption. We in Germany, we have about 120 cases in court right now of very prominent international companies. I mean, not only Siemens, but also MIN and Daimler and uh, uh, RBB and uh, uh, Julius Berger and so on. So it's a, it's an amazing change in, in Germany uh, and in most other countries which have signed the OECD convention. Um, it is uh, quite similar. Um, in London, um, uh, big companies are looking for compliance officers right now. They are trying to get their system uh, in, in shape so that they don't have to be afraid that their staff get involved in corruption. So it is a total change and uh, and I think um, everybody uh, recognizes this at this point. Now, uh, more recently you've uh, had some uh, new initiatives beyond Transparency International. You were also uh, a leader in the founding of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative and very recently in a new fisheries Transparency and Initiative. Uh, so could you tell us about each of those? Well, I think the, after I left um, the chair of Transparency International, I'm still the chair of the Advisory Council, but um, the running of Transparency International is in very good hands right now. Um, I uh, wanted to help to do something in a sector which is particularly vulnerable to corruption, and that is the extractive industries. I mean, in mining and oil and gas, the amounts of money which are being put at risk, you know, billions of dollars for uh, platforms in the sea around uh, relatively fragile countries like uh, Equatorial Guinea and so on. 
uh, they have the temptation uh, to bribe and to be bribed is, uh, is very high uh, because uh, you can buy stability, you can buy to some extent at least sort of a spurious sense of uh, uh, permanence and predictability of what is happening in the sector. And therefore we always felt it will be very hard with our normal tools of Transparency International to control corruption. Um, therefore we approached this with a different concept. I mean we um, uh, started first what is called um, the Publish What You Pay initiative where we try to appeal to companies that they publish what they pay to their host governments. But then very quickly we found that some governments like Angola for instance would not allow um, uh, BP and Exxon and so on to publish what they pay. They basically refer to confidentiality clauses in their investment agreements. And so um, we thought uh, for a while that this idea uh, was more or less dead. But then uh, to our great delight, um, it was um, of all countries, Nigeria under the leadership of President Obazanyo which uh, declared that they would not only allow the companies to publish what they pay to the Nigerian government, but they would even make it mandatory and uh, the government would publish what they receive from the companies. And that is basically how in 2003 transparency uh, uh, was introduced in the extractive industry sector. Now about 51 countries are implementing this concept uh, where um, this a triangular arrangement of a multi-stakeholder working group in the country develops information which is credible because it is a result of a deliberative process, you know, of a democratic process where everybody can speak their mind. And, um, and it's doing very well under the new leadership. I mean, I left EITI also in uh, 2011. And uh, the experience there is that uh, if you are moderate in what you demand from um, the private sector and from governments and from civil society in trying to bring them together uh, to produce credible information, uh, then you can begin to lay the basis for better governance in this sector. And um, therefore we were very happy when um, DFID uh, developed with some people from Transparency International an organization in the pr procurement sector that is called COST, which has its headquarters in Ethiopia, uh, which has a similar goal and deals with procurement in big projects. Um, I myself um, uh, was um, uh, interested to get involved in the textile sector. So when Rana Plaza happened uh, in Bangladesh, we began to um, promote the idea that also in uh, the textile sector one could have a multi-stakeholder working group which would report about certain aspects of governance uh, like child labor, like minimum uh, uh, salaries, like uh, uh, labor union uh, activities, but also environmental destruction, uh, fire safety, in general building safety and, uh, and so on. And, um, and there we found quite a number of countries which are participating. Uh, we are now discussing with Ethiopia that they join us in this. But um, it's a difficult area because uh, in particular the German government has itself now started an uh, initiative in this area where they try to control the whole supply chain of uh, textile being sold in Germany. Now. Um, they are not yet certain whether they consider our initiative as complementary and supportive or whether they feel that ours is really not necessary because they are doing everything. Um, and then very interesting the fishery sector. I mean there we have been working with the Mauritanian government since a year. Um, there is an offshore declaration by the president of Mauritania where he explains that um, in the fishery sector for instance uh, uh, big international fishing fleets you know, from China, from Russia, from Spain, they basically overfish in their waters and uh, therefore local fishermen don't find enough fish to even bother to go out and, uh, and catch fish for uh, the nutrition of their own populations. Um, so many, the country is basically having its resources stolen? Yeah, I mean partly stolen, partly also 
sold by corrupt decision makers. You know, I mean, if you, for instance, have a system where you can buy, say, 20,000 tons of octopus and um, you have basically sold this to the European Union, which normally uh, then makes it available to European fishermen. But then a, a businessman comes from another country, from Russia, from China, and says, I also want to, to catch 5,000 tons. And uh, you accept a bribe from that person, send it perhaps to Panama, and, uh, and thereby uh, you get overfishing and you perhaps this one minister or this one head of a, uh, a st parastatal company has a little profit which they can uh, take to a tax haven, but um, uh, the whole society will suffer, you know, uh, lose jobs, lose uh, environmental sustainability, uh, lose nutrition to the people. In many African countries, 40% of um, the nutrition comes from, uh, from f the fishery sector. And if uh, the fish disappear, then uh, this can be a real disaster in, in Africa, in addition to, uh, to the problems of climate change, which is hitting Africa also very hard. What's the biggest change you'd like to see in international rules or practices that might uh, contribute to better control of corruption? Well, I believe um, the tolerance of anonymous companies in tax havens and so on is a tremendous uh, danger to, uh, to global governance. Uh, not only does it um, encourage corruption and uh, organized crime and drug trafficking, and, uh, but it also um, encourages uh, transfer pricing, for instance, which very often in the extractive sector uh, makes it possible for companies to have all their profits uh, somewhere outside the producing countries. You know. so and it, hence no tax to be paid. There are absolutely no tax and no royalties and, and no other payments because uh, the companies say in Zambia they have no, no uh, profit you know, because um, the product is sold, um, this is just a fictitious example, uh, is sold to a corporate relative of the owner of the mines in Zambia uh, at a very low price. And uh, there are, of course, efforts to control transfer pricing, but it's very difficult as long as you have uh, these um, companies where the beneficial owners are not, not known. And I have the feeling that this is also uh, moving right now, uh, that, that area, because nowadays, for the first time, the G20 governments feel that they are also hurt. In the past we have been preaching this for, for years, but uh, it was mainly uh, the developing world which was suffering. I mean, there's a report by Tabon Beki uh, for the African Union of uh, uh, February, uh, March last year, in which he basically demonstrated that about $50 billion are uh, leaving Africa uh, through um, uh, illicit uh, financing streams, you know, and um, but that didn't impress people very much. Um, now, of course, they are impressed because uh, Mr. Schäuble and uh, and other ministers of finance see that their rich people don't pay uh, their taxes, you know? and so I have a feeling that something will change there. And uh, in that sense, the Panama Papers, even though they are quite a catastrophe in terms of showing how much corruption there still is, uh, also a good uh, sort of uh, attention call for, for the world. Okay, Peter Eigen, thank you very much for the work you've been doing over the last quarter century to raise international consciousness about uh, corruption and to mobilize people and in inst new institutions in the fight for it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Well, I must say I'm uh, very pleased to be here at Stanford. And I'm very pleased to be here with you, uh, Larry, uh, because we have been struggling together uh, since a couple of years in many different fora. So thanks a lot, and I feel honored to be here. It's our pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you.